fix and sit and I should do something and just do whatever I have no idea what I'm gonna say. It's kinda of, it's, it's fantastic. All these people show up to do this to talk. So thank you. Here I start. I suppose we should. Alright, let's get started. Good morning everybody. Good morning. Good morning this on as they say. It will be soon. He's going, he's running. Anybody on the run will he make it? No. Are there any sound guys in the room? <laughs> oh, where is it? Microphones. Oh, there we go. It's kind of like a loudspeaker with backwards, right? That, that's, that works. All right. Let's see here. I knew I should have printed it and not relied on technology. No, I don't want Siri. All right. Well, thanks a lot for coming to this panel discussion on horns. Um, before we turn it over to the, uh, and introduce the gentleman on my left, I, I want you to just think about for a moment, how many people have heard sound played through community, family, EAW, electric voice, Fulcrum Acoustic, Klipsch, JBL, and Marcus Hines? Probably, well, I, I expect everybody here has, but think about how many people in the world have heard sound <laughs> through those devices, it's probably easier to count the people who haven't. And to me, that's one of the reasons I'm so excited to be able to moderate this panel, because the gentlemen sitting before you are largely responsible for a lot of that. And um, this is a rare opportunity to get to interact with them and hear their points of view. And I hope you come with, you come with questions. Um, so let me, um, let me go through and introduce them to you. Uh, my name is Doug Jones, and I'm going to start with Don Keel because his is the first. Start with me first. <laughs> I think one always starts with Don Keel. I did. Um, I think everything starts with Don Keel. Don has worked for a number of companies in the area of loudspeaker R and D and measurement technology, including, take a deep breath, Electro Voice, Klipsch, JBL, Crown, and Harman International. He's an AES fellow, holds eight patents with topics including concert activity loudspeaker horns, uh, loudspeaker arrays, and signal processing. Currently, he leads his own company, uh, consulting company, DBK Associates. His passion for the last 17 years has been to promote the use of CBT loudspeaker technology uh, in the audio industry. Mr. Keel holds two BS degrees, one in electrical engineering, one in physics, and an MSEE with a minor in acoustics. Since 72, he's presented and published over 65 technical papers, which I know you've all read. Right? Okay. Uh, among them, the paper for which he won the AES Publication Award, Low Frequency Loudspeaker Assessment by Near Field Sound Pressure Measurement. It's a great paper. In 02, he received the Scientific and Engineering Academy Award from the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences for work he did on cinema, concert activity loudspeakers. He also received the AES Gold Medal in 2016 for outstanding and significant research, design, and product development over a period of more than 45 years of loudspeaker, loudspeaker systems providing broadband constant coverage performance. Please welcome Don Keel. I'd like to meet this guy. Where is he? <laughs> he's, he's the guy sitting in the middle there. <laughs> Okay, Dave Gunnis, Dave, wave, call him Dave, is, and it went blank. Here we go. Is a co-founder and vice president of R&D for Fulcrum Acoustic, a U.S.-based professional loudspeaker manufacturer. Prior to starting Fulcrum, he'd spent 11 years as a loudspeaker designer for EV, and 12 years as director of R&D for EAW. David is well known for his innovative loudspeaker designs and has been a member of AES Standards Committee since the early 90s. Please welcome David Gunnis. <laughs> I'm really, I don't know, pleased on some, I guess that's the right word to say, to, to introduce the next guest to you. My very first experience with sound system design um, and installation back when the earth was cooling and dinosaurs roamed freely, um, was installing a all-community system in a 
roller rink in Chicago with uh, a couple of extended Levi's and um, all uh, Macintosh tube amplifiers, which is why Ray Rayburn asked me to come along with him and do this. <laughs> <laughs> and I think we could actually push people around the roller rink with the, the bass pedal tones from the organ through the uh, extended Levi's. So um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you um, Bruce House, president of and co-founder of Community Professional Loudspeakers. Community began in 1968, making PA system components for the then fledgling tour sound industry. Community's early products were horns and enclosures made of fiberglass, materials and fabrication methods that remain integral to many community products to the present day. <coughs> in the 80s, Community began designing and manufacturing transducers starting with the M4 mid-range driver. The 80s also saw the first complete speaker systems from community focused on the professional PA and MI markets. In the, 19, in the 90s, uh, community began to use their expertise in fiberglass to create weatherproof systems, launching the R series of horn-loaded systems and the WET series of combined direct radiator and horn systems. In 2018, as community celebrates its 50th anniversary, its product offering has expanded to cover the complete range of installed speaker systems. Please welcome Bruce House. And a guy I've recently met, Tom Danley, um, has been interested in <laughs> radio electronics, loudspeakers, and hi-fi for a long time. In 1979, he went to work for Intersonics, a NASA hardware contractor working with acoustic levitation. While at Intersonics, Tom was awarded 17 patents for acoustic and electromagnetic levitation devices, as well as a servo drive subwoofer, uh, an air cooling system that eliminated power compression, and the rotary driver used in the Phoenix Cyclone. In addition to his inventions, Tom designed and built major portions of hardware uh, flown on space shuttle flights STS-7 and STS-51A. In 2005, Tom and Mike Hedden founded Danley Sound Labs, and at DSL, he's developed the synergy horn, the tapped horn, the paraline, the shaded amplitude horn, and a layered combiner which is used to combine the output of as many as 64 compression drivers into one horn. Tom presented papers at, and has been invited speaker at the AES Acoustical Society and presented on both acoustic and electromagnetic levitation at Jet Propulsion Labs. Um, and he adds, he was one of the early TEF-10 users and is thankful that his boss had the insight to send him to SanadCon and to have him join the AES. Please welcome my friend Tom Daly. <laughs> and last but certainly not least is Paul Peace. Paul currently serves as director, uh, as senior director of engineering for Community. Um, previous roles include lead engineer and leadership positions with JVL Professional, Rankus Hines, IMAX Corporation, Frazier, and Auditoria. Paul has a degree in applied physics from Georgia Tech and is currently working on a master's in acoustics from Penn State. Paul has designed hundreds of horns for many diverse applications and products such as loudspeakers in virtually all IMAX theaters, uh, JVL VLA Compact, JVL Sculptured Surround, Samsung Oinz Onyx Audio System, JBL C200 series, uh, OAP Sonus Lab series, among many applications, specific custom products. Paul's research in horn technology includes decades of work with asymmetry, horn within horn configurations, co-entrant and collinear methods, dual to similar arraying, and single plane apertures. Please welcome Paul Peace. <laughs> now, Don Keel, as our sort of senior statesman um, has asked if we would uh, show a few slides. Um, so if you would um, please. Can I come up here? Can you talk right there? Okay, or would fine. you rather stand up here? I guess I'd rather stand up there, but then you're, you're going to be flipping the slides for me. Well, you can, you can flip them yourself if you want. <laughs> <coughs> Oh, okay, fine. That's what's up, that's what's next. 
Okay, what I'm, what I'm going to start with now, I know the topic of this panel is the future of horns. This is, what I'm going to be presenting is some of the history of the horns, particularly ones which I've been involved with at Electra Voice and JBL. And I'm, not, I'm going to go through these really fast. Doug indicated to me that I sent him, well, I'd like to give a presentation at the seminar that will take an hour. And Doug said, no, no, this is a panel. Now, you can't give a presentation like that. So this, I'm just going to go through these really, really fast. I'm not going to read much of it here. But, uh, I was primarily involved with Electra Voice and in, at JBL. And they, here's the, uh, the times which I was there. My original presentation had a large section on the Alphic manta ray horns, but I'm leaving that out in this discussion. The first horns I worked at with Electra Voice was, was when I was there from 72 to 76 as a systems engineer. And I worked on the large so-called white horns. And some of you may be familiar with some of these. And I wrote a technical paper on that. And I'm not going to go into much detail here, but I, one of the problems of the old horns was the fact that they, they had a mid-range narrowing problem that I, in conjunction with a couple of other people that I was working with, solved that by doing in-flaring. There were three separate horns that I worked out of, a 90-40, 60-40, and a 40-20, and they were called the HR horns. They were big fiberglass horns, and uh, we worked on some rather sophisticated spec sheets for these horns with detailed beam width information and pores. Now this is what it looked like. This, Jim Long is now retired. He was with EV for a long, long time. And this, these are the HR 9040 horns in his living room. And uh, there's a picture of myself on the, the right and Jim Long there standing in the center. So these horns have a very direct field. It's of course very dominant on these. There's hardly any room because it's a very tight 90 by 40. I, at JBL, I worked on the biradial constant coverage horns. And one of, my, one of the first things that they as, assigned me to was a group to develop a series of horns that would compete with the electric voice horns. So I, find my, I found myself in the unique position of trying to work around my own patent that I had at Electra Horse. We came up with the, the biradial nomenclature. There were a number of horns that I worked with there. Uh, the large 2360, 65, the flat front biradial horns, the biradial studio monitors, the defined coverage 4660. Some of you may, uh, this is the, the large 2360, 90 by 40 horn. And this is the, uh, the uh, and this is the cinema system which uses it. And these are the three biradial horns that I worked with. Again, it, and this is the, the cinema system that utilizes it. The, there are a series of flat front biradial horns, 2370, 2380, 2385. They didn't they didn't have a, a curved front like that, but. It, was flat front it was a bit easier to mount in a cabinet. And then I worked on the, uh, the biradial studio monitors. But these horns were kind of called the butt cheeks horns for obvious reasons. <laughs> these, yeah, but these had a long, I mean, these were, these were in their line for a long, long time. Uh, I worked on the, a, a tweeter version, the 2404, a 4660, which was a single system which covers a rectangular region, which was basically wide up front and narrow in the rear, with all with one horns. Now here, I, this is, I'm gonna close this now. My, my granddaughter, Alexandria, is now in college in Columbus, Ohio, and she's, I think, 19 years old. But 10 years ago, she was in dancing and, and I, she, she lives in San Diego, and she went to a place called Jiminy Kids Gymnastics in San Diego. And this facility had a real sophisticated central cluster. 
Now, can anybody here see that central cluster up there? Uh, I'll give you a hint. There, it's right there. Now, th this was the cluster. Very sophisticated. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I went to see my granddaughter <laughs> perform at the... I really got a kick out of this. <laughs> okay, that's it. I thought that was one of my better sound systems. I don't know. Just an indication of the uh, incestuousness of our industry. Um, when I started at EV, I worked for Cliff Hendrickson, who was involved in the manta rays at Altec yes, Lansing. Yes, yeah. Very, very good point. And one of my first projects was to replace Don's white horns with a new line of horns to, com to compete with his JBL horns. <laughs> and when I left, I haven't heard this one. <laughs> yeah, so the HP horns were my first horn designs. And when I left EV, Don came back to EV and occupied the office that I had been in. Okay, all right. So I was just, just all too. Clifford came to the community and we worked on the M4 together. All there right. you go. <laughs> everything's, everything's intertwined. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> it's all the same, guys. Right, so. Um, I, this is really about you guys asking questions of them, um, but in case you're all going to sit there and just stare at these people up here and not ask questions, I'm just going to start off by throwing out a softball here and see how it goes. So if you, if you don't mind, you guys have all designed horns and used horns quite a bit. So, why horns? I mean, what made horns interesting? You want to take a shot at anybody? All of you? At um, once? Pattern throwing and get loud. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, it allowed you to design a, a constant directivity, constant coverage, yeah. very uniform coverage, both on axis and in the far field, you know, or off to the sides. Expand on pattern control. That it, it's, I mean, there. Are, anything big is going to have control, but one of <clears throat> with high frequency horns particularly, it allows you to make a precise pattern or a specific pattern, a 90 by 40 and a and a 60 by 30. Right? You know, have very different properties architecturally, especially, and uh, trying to do that with direct radiators is. I think if you went back to the beginning, say it was the efficiency you could get from a horn. You know, it was. It was the efficiency you could get from a horn that was the most important thing. And the, the horns of those days, uh, the high frequencies were very narrow. So after the uh, after they didn't have to use 300B tubes for output anymore, uh, then then you could address or start to address pin and. It was a, a whole, whole different world. Paul, do you want to say anything? Being able to get high frequency energy, not only pattern control, but also enough level and the, the integrity of the signal that you wanted, um, that's, that's where horns mostly come in. And then one of the things that I keep fighting, and I know these, these guys working with it too, is not just think of horns for high frequency only, but we need pattern control that's consistent, way lower than what we consider high frequency. Absolutely. I got one more comment. Cool. When I was at EV the first time, this would have been uh, 72 to 76, we went and gave a presentation in Boston with one of our new big white horns. And we, what we did specifically was compare the big white constant directivity horn with a conventional radial horn, you know, straight sides, and it beams sight quite significantly. And what we learned, if you take the microphone and hold it up close to the mouth and measure its frequency response, it's quite flat. But once you get farther and farther into the far field in a big space like this, what you measure rolls off quite dramatically. 
particularly with a, you know, the real-time analyzer standard. But one thing that's surprising, if you do this with a big constant directivity horn, the response near the horn and way in the far away is pretty much the same. So it, and you, typically there's a, a so-called house curve that a lot of times you have to specify. But if, if it's more constant directivity, you don't really have to have a house curve. It's pretty much the same near and far. Any, any questions out there to do yet? No? Okay. So I'm kind of wondering, are there any, because here's your opportunity, right? Are there any myths about horns that you would like to try to dispel? <laughs> Go. Jump in. Well, uh, at least in the hi-fi area, which is where my interest had been most of my life, uh, the, the lore was that horns had a honky sound. And if you, uh, if you really go through it and look at it, I, I suppose a horn could have a sound like that, but usually what you had was a, a big peak in the impedance curve, and that would interact with the crossover producing a big peak in the response. Um, a lot of people, at least in the olden days, including myself, would, uh, you'd, you'd pick up a loudspeaker book and look at the nomograph to say, okay, I need a capacitor this big. And all of that was based on having a resistive load. And horns are not, I mean, they can be resistive, uh, but they're usually a, have a pretty interesting impedance curve, which interacts with the crossover. And uh, pretty often that would be the cause of the honkiness. How many? Go ahead. Uh, going way back to the late 80s, uh, Cliff Hendrickson had a technique that you may have gotten from Bruce, where uh, when he was listening to a horn or a compression driver, he would just plug it in and listen to it with, with no EQ applied. And when you listen to a horn that way, then you, you, you kind of you get a sense of this is the character of this particular horn and driver, and after a while I wished that he hadn't showed me that tactic because <laughs> once you put it in the system and you EQ the death out of it, you can never forget that characteristic sound um, because there is a, a characteristic honk, if you want to call it that, to a particular horn, and it wasn't until 20, 25 years later that it felt like I could mitigate that which in my case was done with processing to, to cancel the resonance that causes that, uh, that particular sound. It's a, it's a non-minimum phase thing, so you can't EQ it out with IR and, and, uh, and get rid of it. There's always some, some bit of it left. It's a similar thing if you uh, do a generation loss test on a loudspeaker. Uh, through that, you can hear by the second generation easily uh, the flaws. And the problem is if you take take the headphones off and go back to listen to the speaker, now you can hear that you know, once you've heard it. You call that generation loss? But yeah, like they used to do with tape recordings. Uh, we did that with loudspeakers. You use an instrument microphone and play music through it and record it and then play that back so you can okay, I understand. simulate generations of error. <coughs> a similar thing that up in the anechoic chamber at ED, we put a loudspeaker in the anechoic chamber play it through the loudspeaker, take the signal from the measurement mic and play it through a loudspeaker out yeah. in the room. So you're doubling the effect. Yeah. So if you're, if you're not quite sure whether you're hearing something, you double the effect and it's like, mm -hmm. now it's really obvious. Same, same thing. It's, it's funny too how usually by the third generation or, or maybe the fourth, the loudspeaker is unlistenable even if it's really good to start with. Yeah, and so it goes back to the, the character thing. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, you're making an exaggeration of it. Or caricature, maybe that's a better word. Well, I'm, I'm a firm believer in designing so-called constant directivity, constant coverage, whose three-dimensional polar pattern remains the same at frequency, and I believe that those kind of horns sound less honky than other potential ones. And the honkiness comes from the fact that the polar pattern is changing quite dramatically. And the fact that what's spraying the sidewalls isn't, you know, an even spectral content. 
And if it is even, it sounds less honky. I was, that's my position, so. Uh, it, it helps that uh, if, it, if the pattern is, is very consistent, then what's coming outside the pattern and coming back from the walls and yeah, the ceiling absolutely. doesn't, doesn't uh, combine with the, with the direct response. Yeah. Great. Like if you if you listen to an Altec A7 on axis and have it EQ'd, it sounds great. But if you move anywhere else in the room, it's oh, not, not so great. Yeah. I mean, it's this whole situation of you have a system set up in a room like this, but walk outside the door and close the door and see how it sounds. Yeah. The systems that are more or less constant energy radiation and sound sound good outside or behind a barrier or something. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> I mean, the reverb and feel is flat, right? I mean, or, or potentially. Yeah, I began studying the uh, time domain behavior of my horns a couple of decades ago and discovered that putting small asymmetries into the design, even if the pattern was meant to be symmetric, actually helped smear a good bit of the resonance behavior. And really, you said asymmetry, asymmetry okay. within the horn. If you have strong symmetry, then everything's going to come back in on itself, yeah. particularly on axis. But asymmetries in the design will help smear that, and you particularly see this in the time domain look. Which I think was what Dave was was interesting. Yeah, it's a, so, it's a, it's even stronger effect in a in a, uh, a horn in cone coax. Yeah. Um, the very first one I designed was Electric Boy's product called the Music Caster 100. Oh yes, <laughs> was, remember it well. <laughs> yeah, this was a replacement for the for the 1953 or something, <clears throat> music, or 1963. Um, it used a, a dome tweeter, which was round, and I it was one of my first, it was actually my very first project as a as a as a professional, and I just designed a simple plastic horn the one on the front of the dome tweeter that was perfectly round. And what was the original ones had a T35 tweeter in it? Yeah, when did that, right. that was, that was before that time though. Yeah, that, that's what they did up until 84 when I had to redesign it. To, okay, to interesting. Make a rotomobile box yeah. because the injected fiberglass box, the, uh, the manufacturer of the cabinet wouldn't make them anymore. It was, a, it was an obsolete process. So I had to redesign it for a rotomobile box. But because this horn was round, whatever wrapped around and came back off the cone in every direction, it all came back the same. So there was a, there was a sharp notch at five kilohertz because all of those reflections came out the same. Yep. And uh, if you go to our, the fulcrum booth out on the floor, you'll see that none of those horns, there's a lot of asymmetry to them. There's, there's projecting surfaces and it's a different distance at any point in the horn from the cone. And that smears out those reflections enough that you know they're not uh, they're not objectionable. Anymore. Not piling up on one spot. Right. Didn't the original music caster wasn't that square? I, I'm going to the original read. music caster was like a, a box inside a box. Okay. Where the whole perimeter was was a was a port. Yes. Okay. It was, it was a big thing that, that you know <clears throat> hit in the bushes in theme parks. And uh, you know the. The replacement was just a rotor molded box. I mean, and the original had a T35 tweeter, which is physically about that high, yeah. and maybe about that wide, a little compression driver tweeter that mm -hmm. operated above, I don't know, 4K or something? 2K. Yeah, it wasn't much. Yeah, it was 2K. 2K. <laughs> we combined at 2K, it had a huge peak in it. Yeah. And uh, I wanted to make the music caster flat, but it had to match the existing one, so I had to let the crossover go so that there was a big haystack at 2K. I mean, and Paul clips all over the T35, because yeah. that was in the <laughs> clips horn and all that. Do you, do you know who designed the T35? Uh, did you? I don't know. I know, that, that was way before my time. Okay. I replaced it. <laughs> I have no idea. Ray Newman, maybe? Hey? Ray Newman, maybe? I think it might go back even before no, him. No, before him. Yeah, I mean, I worked for Ray myself, yes, I did. So we have a question from the audience here. Oh, and there we go. Um, got a quick question on the constant directivity horns. Um, back home in the UK, they're quite common in vintage horns that you guys designed, obviously a long time ago at EV and so on, in 
a lot of systems that are used for dance music parties. Um, people with not a lot of money who buy vintage systems or old stuff that's still really good. But I have a really big bone of contention with a lot of these guys because they don't use or refuse to use the CD corrective EQ that's commonly recommended because they think it robs them of headroom. Um, so obviously for them, SPL is king in a day rat society. Um, but I have a big argument with them as to why that's necessary. The point never seems to come across too well with some, some of the younger guys as to why that EQ is applied to constant directivity horns. Do you have anything I could use or record that I can maybe show them in future to, to explain that? You don't have any monitors up here, so I had a little bit hard time understanding what you were saying. I was listening to the reverber field. Thing. <laughs> <laughs> I heard corrective EQ though. What, what, yeah. he's, what he's asking is, um, in the UK they have a lot of vintage horns that show up from time to time, a lot of the concert activity stuff that you guys worked on. And correct me yeah. if I'm getting the translation wrong here. Yeah. Um, because we're, we're separated by a common language, you yeah. guys. Um, <laughs> but, but he's finding it difficult to convince the users of these vintage products to employ the correct constant directivity correction or EQ that you guys would recommend. Yeah. Right? I, I don't know. There's, there's well, a. Yeah, uh, I just want to be fair with Slap. Yeah. Yeah. They, they, that, that requires EQ. They want, the, they want the SPL preserved, though. For them, that EQ, because it looks on a graph like a big boost, they think, oh, well, I've lost all my headroom there. I'm not going to be able to play as loud as the next show, guy. Show them the RTA of the signal when you put music through it, because the music rolling off and the boost is going up, and, and in the end, it's, it's fairly flat. Mm. There's, a, there's kind of a, we don't see it much in the pro sound market, but in, in uh, certainly in home hi-fi and often in, in studios, there's kind of a, uh, assumed concept that there's such a thing as a perfect loudspeaker <laughs> and all you have to do is remove all the flaws and then it'll be perfectly flat mm -hmm. where the reality is that a perfect vibrating diaphragm is not flat it's not constant directivity um, so no the only way to get flat response is through engineering you have to engineer it to be flat and so the, you know, the, the naive assumption that, well, if you have to EQ it, then it's wrong. Mm -hmm. No, it's because it's a physical loudspeaker and that doesn't exist in nature. There's I, no, there's I have no that naturally argue, perfect line. I have that argument a lot with people who just <clears> say <throat> EQ is the devil and it's... <laughs> a lot of it is, but it's, you can't get around it. <laughs> yeah, a lot of the horns had curved walls. Yeah. And so that meant at high frequencies, they got very narrow. Mm -hmm. And if... if back in the day, if you picked the right compression driver and the right horn on axis, you could get flat, flat response, yeah, without EQ. But if you have an audience where you want everybody to hear, you have to have uh, broad directivity up high, and that reveals the true power response of the driver. Yeah, if you take that same driver and put it on a constant directivity horn, all of a sudden you say, oh, there's no top end. Where did yeah. it go? Well, it, where it went was everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> we I mean, the first, first time I heard one of your white horns. Said no top end. This is no good for the top end. Well, and <laughs> on, on, the other <laughs> side, <laughs> on, on the other side of the corn, we had, I think it was called a CLS 95. That was a, a like a straight wall, uh, it was a community horn, I'm sure. I probably got the model name wrong because it's 25, 30 years ago. But uh, we used that as a check on the anechoic chamber because it was naturally flat. It was it was collapsing critically. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, a constant directivity horn. But if you could compare a new, not a new, I mean a recent or CD horn versus like a, a radio standard radio horn, if you measure it on axis, it looks pretty good. But as you go off to the sides, of course, it rolls off. But a constant directivity horn. Yes, it's rolled off on axis, but it's rolled off by the same amount at all the off axis. So if you apply the EQ to that, mm -hmm. it makes it flat everywhere. But, uh, you know, depending on the spectral content of your program material, I mean, if, you, if you're playing pink noise through this system, which is flat, that has a lot more high end than typical program material. Yeah. Or if you want to play something like tambourine, which has 
you know, energy up to 25 kilohertz and it's flat. If your system doesn't have to reproduce that, that don't, don't worry about the EQ you have to put into it. The, I tell you, the common thing I see in these vintage systems, so it's probably easy for me to use the mic yeah. so everybody can hear Sorry. Um, so a, a common thing I see with a lot of these, of these vintage systems is that they go without the CD EQ and then they decide that there's not enough top end and end up putting a bullet system or slot tweeters directly above it um, with no time alignment and then they think this sounds great because it's really bitey and horrible. And it's, it's particularly in the reggae world, I see this, um, in the sort of reggae sound systems where they're all deaf anyway. Um, what? <laughs> but um, you see systems where they've got these big vintage horns that look great and they, they sound great in the mid to high region and then they've got literally an array of like 16 bullet tweeters in a straight on grid directly above them. And it's just, it's madness to me that you know, they, they, rather than use EQ, but these guys don't use processing, a lot of them. They again, they're kind of analog and vintage. So they would rather run with a, a preamp they use, which is a, a, you know, maybe splits the frequencies. It doesn't have any EQ, any time alignment, any of this kind of stuff. There, there are different ways to listen, and uh, one of them is to just listen to spectral balance. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, that's what people did in the 80s in the touring market. If you got the spectral balance right, that was all you could hope for. Um, and the interesting thing is that with with DSP and all of that, you can you can make things very coherent, have them some, you know, in a nice fashion where you have you know pretty consistent coverage and all of that. But to get all of that right to the point where it really has a nice impulse response, that definitely sounds better. Mm -hmm. But the surprising thing is that if it's not exactly right, it's still okay. And if it's really really bad. It can still be okay. Yeah. It's just you just got the impulse response you're talking about. Yeah, now? yeah. Like okay. a really good impulse response is noticeably better than a not so good impulse response. But going from there to a horrible impulse response is not nearly as bad as you would expect it to be. I mean, isn't all of that reflected in the frequency response also, though? Yeah, I, everything. It's, there's so much other stuff going on that uh, it has to be almost perfect before you get a benefit from it. Oh, the question over here. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm just too focused in on your answers. I'm not doing my job. <laughs> he brought up a, a very good question, and, and my question is uh, somewhat similar. And if I'm understanding correctly, what you guys were saying is when you design the compression driver, it's designed to be flat, right? But as you go up in volume, it kind of steers. No, it can't no. be flat. It can't be flat. Okay, it can't be flat. It's a material limitation that that the strength of the motor and the, and the mass. Mass, yes. Yeah, they, they all have high frequency roll up. And, and in my experience, I uh, had some challenges where I'm sure you want to get a lot of energy, so you want to kind of excite the sound. But I was wondering, all of the years that they have been doing sound systems, PAs, whatever, you know, the, the, the high end is extremely important in the horn design and everything like that. And I always wonder why, why have they never built a DSP that, is, that has a symbiotic relationship with the amplifier? And I ran across a product once that actually did that to where the amplifiers plugged into the DSP processor. And it EQ'd as it you know, went through and the relationship with that type of system was phenomenal. And I was just wondering why the designers never go that direction with, with designs. I don't understand this question. I think you're talking about linearity. So one way to approach it is to, is to, is to nonlinear you know, frequency response that changes with level. Okay. One approach is to take a driver that changes response with level. And the other approach is to look and look and work and work until you make a driver that doesn't change with level. And then use linear processing instead of <coughs> nonlinear processing. And that's, that, yeah. that was the idea of the M4, right? Make something that would get loud enough that you didn't have to mess with it. 
I, uh, I bought a year A 813B about nine years ago um, when we were first starting Fulcrum at double 15 coax. And uh, the idea was to pitch a company on uh, having me design a studio monitor that was kind of like that. But I started out with the 813 and I was just going to try and show that that uh, with DSP I could make an 813 sound way better than I ever did in the day. And I could at one level, but every time you turn it up 3D, it turned into a different speaker. And what I realized is that over the intervening 30, 35 years, transducers have gotten so much better that they don't, that they're, they're much more consistent over, um, variations in level. And so the 813s ended up in the dumpster, I think, and started from scratch with modern drivers and then and then the concept worked. So, you know, if you're if you're if you feel like your system is really changing character with level, um, you know, I'll sell you a better system. <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> Or, you or, mentioned or the S well. Or, 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 or. <laughs> yeah, any of us can accommodate. Yes. <laughs> but making sure you have the right amplifier is a big part of that too. Uh, making sure you have the right amplifier so that it's linear. Right. Oftentimes you run into amplifier problems before you do loudspeaker problems, mm -hmm. in my experience. Right. Yeah, that concept that I, I, I tried that time, it, I don't know how it did. There's a couple of them that have done that. The EV Delta Max back in the late 80s, early 90s, that had a big back path. Mm -hmm. I think uh, Rekus Hines, um, what was it called? I think Rekus Hines had one that had a, a big back uh, path from the output of the amplifier to the processor. A few people have done that over the years, but uh, it's fallen out of favor because the necessity has pretty much gone away. Coda still do it. Coda from Germany, BMS company, they still have sense lines for their subs at least, I think. Did you have a question, Barry? Pardon? you have a question? Oh, well, I'm going to wait. If nobody jumps in, I do. Go ahead. Um, I had a question on that sort of linearity side then. So you have, um, obviously Dave, I know you've, you're big into the, to t the TQ thing with the FIR and the uh, cancellation reflections in the horn. Um, obviously that's kind of to the extreme opposite of what I was saying before with the analog is king, no EQ, um, design a better loudspeaker crowd. Could you explain why you went down that path and how you think it's justified for all those kind of people? Um, sure, uh, it's a little, I'll, I'll make it brief because it's kind of a departure from the horn thing, but um, the, the short answer is because I like the result better. Mm -hmm. So what it comes down to is uh, if you start out with a uh, ideological objection to it, that, oh, well, DSP is bad, so I'm gonna do everything pure analog, then fine, go do that. But if, if you're open to whatever works, then you just go with whatever works best for you. And the fact is I've been able to achieve better results that way than, than the other way. I was more referring to how you feel it helps with discontinuities or errors in a horn or coaxial horn and loudspeaker system because I'm seeing a lot more of these particularly things like wedges um, and they are horn loudspeakers um, but obviously with people trying to move to a single perceived point source um, and obviously a lot of problems you find like you say is reflections like in the early speaker you designed um, I was wondering how it's you know for a lot of people who don't understand what the tool is doing perhaps and, yeah. and maybe don't understand why it's applied. Well in, in my case I'm, I'm going to put the DSP on it regardless. No matter how good I make it, I'm still, it's still going to be used always with DSP. Um, so knowing that, you're, that it's ultimately going to have DSP applied, <clears throat> that gives you more flexibility as to what you can do with it. Like, I might, like for, if, for instance, uh, one product is a, is a large coaxial horn. It's a, a big horn mouth with a horn in the middle copy of something Bruce did when I was a baby. Um, <laughs> but I added a, a, a 
folded horn section at the back in order to extend the low frequency response. And I would never have done that if I didn't know I could, because a folded horn doesn't sound good on vocals. Mm -hmm. And I would never have done that if I didn't know that I was gonna be able to correct that with DSP at the end. So in that way, having the DSP available opened up a uh, design possibility that I would have avoided otherwise. Yeah, and the time alignment requirements of that too. Oh yeah, yeah adding the extra delay. Mm -hmm. There's a question back here. Let, let's bring a mic to you, please. My name's Rob Manuel. I'm from Memphis, Tennessee. Thank you for all being here, panelists. So I'm looking for the dinosaur who may have been with Altec the longest. No insult intended. Um, I'm curious about the Altec uh, 804. That'd be the multi-cell horn. Who remembers that? Multi-cell horn? Yeah. <laughs> so this is more of a, a question about comparison and contrast. We've got some great steerable line arrays now where you can set the opening angle and the azimuth and, and it's just wonderful what you can do in a reverberant space. But I'm curious what happened to this old 804. We had used them and, uh, and they acted like a line array if you, if you used them properly. Roll up a piece of foam and shove it up in the unused orange sections that you didn't want to spill on the walls or ceiling. That's what we did. And it seemed to be a low cost solution. What engineering-wise decision made that product go away? They were costly to build. I didn't ask them, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're complicated. And plus, each cell radiated independently up high, so it was, it was really an interfering array, if you look at the polar plots. But yeah, being able to shut off part of it was a, was a valuable thing. They had a tendency to ring the material um, that, you know, those, those are before my time, you know. But uh, I do remember stories um, from the Altec Lansing guys that they, they used to take the 804, was it called? They used to take them across the street to a body shop and have a uh, spray them under coat, under coat yeah. sprayed on them because otherwise you couldn't use them. They would just ring like a bell. Yeah, we, we made some uh, with fiberglass and predominantly brown cells and they just got square in the front. They didn't ring too much. Mm -hmm. and the, effect of, the effectiveness of that whole thing was very frequency restricted. So, I mean, you, you weren't going to do anything effectively below crossover for sure once it got into the woofer. So it's a matter of you want the high directivity pattern and the mid and low directivity pattern matched. I see that as a major issue. Uh, veins within horn designs, I know Dave's used that a good bit. I use it a good bit. They're very, very helpful if used properly. But creating so many multiple exits does become a problem at, at the very high frequencies for sure. Question over here? Yeah, question. <laughs> <laughs> kind of on the same vein here, um, y'all are older than me, or at least the same age. When I was getting into this business, the conventional wisdom was that the radio horns sound better, but we do need constant directivity because we needed the high frequencies to go to more than two people. And I my initial reaction, yeah, okay, whatever, you know, everything has a sound, you know, just, I wrote it off. Until I heard one of the old horns, I'm not sure if it was some community or an Ashford or something of that nature, it's like, my gosh, this thing sounds so much better than the constant directivity horns. And I don't know exactly what, it, certain clarity, I'm not quite sure how to quantify that. Um, my question is, have any of you done any testing to try and, I don't know, multi-tone, what type of testing would, would quantify that? And in, in the vein of history, 
the multi-cell horns were exponential expansion. And I think that's why they sound so good. They, they really work over about an octave. You go above that and the uh, granularity kicks in. You go below that and it falls apart. Um, so second part of my question, I guess, is have, have you looked at anything with modern manufacturing techniques, 3D printing, something of that, to do a multi-cell with much finer granularity? Try to get both exp exponential expansion and the directivity that you want. Hmm. All that. I'd say no, I'm sticking it. <laughs> My experience has been that the conic format is what gives you the best ultimate performance because it's going to give you a solid angle of control. The problem with exponential expansion is First of all, to get it well enough where it's not a dispersive medium in general, which means you got to be at least a decade above cutoff, the expansion rate isn't enough to get the directivity you need, nor does it actually offer constant directivity in the first place. The conic section and, you know, in Keel's uh, and Don's and the manta ray horn concept where you've got an exponential section going to a slot, it ultimately winds up into a, a conic delivery, which is where the control comes. My experience has been that the exponential expansion part is where you get ringing, you get basically pipe resonance type of behavior, and that is some of the degradation in sound and constant directivity on. I've been usually of late going to very small drivers so that I don't have to have an exponential section and go straight to a conic. Exponential Flare, I mean, uh, that was popular in the earlier days because it, it had a more, uh, presented more of a load to the compression driver at the lower end of its response. And uh, Don wrote a paper, what's so, what's so Special or Secret About Exponential Horns, where he kind of uh, revealed uh, that aspect of it. And that, I mean, there's so many things that can be different between you know, one horn and another. What driver is it? How does the horn behave? Um, and horns, at least as far as I've seen, they're a resonant device that's ideally damped at both ends so that the resonance is uh, suppressed to invisibility. But that's not a common occurrence. My uh, assessment of a constant directivity horn versus other horns that were, that were made primarily by trying to make them sound good on axis is that the you know, holding off horizontally until you get to a slot, you get a you get a dominant uh, reflection from the from the slot. And discontinuity, because of the discontinuity, um, and the slot is essential to creating constant directivity, and so the reflection is inevitable. But there are things you can do. One one thing I found was that if if the what I call the tail section before you break into the slot, if that's short enough, then whatever that resonance is is in a range where it doesn't bother you. It gets long enough to where you've got <coughs> 500 1K, 2K resonance, then it's uh, it's much more audible. So, you know, late 90s, I was designing horns, constant directivity horns, in order to try and minimize how bad the slot sounded. And then, you know, 10 years later, I was ignoring that entirely and canceling that, that reflection from the slot. Uh, I mean, in order to get wide horizontal or vertical coverage, you know, it requires relatively small aperture. So if, if one of us guys could come with, up with a compression driver that had a one, in, one half inch output, or maybe a quarter of an inch output, but which was high power, then you wouldn't have to have these slots. <laughs> I've been oh, using multiple sixes. <laughs> I mean, typ a typical compression driver, one of the big, uh, I mean, consider the uh, JBL manufactures a mid-range compression driver, which actually will go down to 250 hertz, and it sort of goes up to five kilohertz, but it has a three-inch exit. <laughs> so, 
Yeah. You definitely need, if you want that thing to go up high, you're going to have to have a slot. But, but typical drivers are in the one and three eighths inch, one and a half inch. A lot of them are one inch diameter, and that's yeah. easier. I mean, think about 20 kilohertz, the wavelength's five eighths of an inch, so that aperture is already big at 20K. Yeah, that's right. Most people can't hear that anyway. So. <laughs> I can if it's loud. Here, 160. <laughs> <laughs> and if, I bet everybody else could too. I never liked 20 kilohertz anyway. Right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I always, always feel like a little bit of an outsider. I'm not in the audio business here, but I have, and I, I can't hear me. Can you hear me? Yep. Yep. Really? Sort um, of. <laughs> sort of. Sorry. I have um, a long, and I've been enamored by horns for a long time. I have a lot of, uh, I've got a lot of um, John Keel's work. I've got a lot of community stuff. Um, I have some Danley stuff. What interests me going forward is the fidelity is getting better and better. Um, as far as what I hear, I'm keenly interested in the boundary coupled subwoofer stuff. Um, you guys are just talking have answered a lot of questions I have, but in, in where are we going forward? I mean, we're, we're definitely making progress, but what's new? Mm. Anybody want to jump in on that? What's new? Well, what's new that I've been working on is just going to very small drivers and multiples and developing those so that you can start at a 0.6 inch entry so that you don't need the slot. Right. In the first 0.6 place. inches in diameter. Right. 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 And using multiples of those and, you know, line array type um, alignments and filtering and shading to achieve what you couldn't do with, with just the horn walls themselves. And what I have found too is using asymmetry in different sections also makes those combinations more interesting and more powerful. So that's definitely a lot of the work that I've been doing lately. All right. I guess most of our business is uh, now is large scale stuff and uh, like stadiums and football arenas and things like that and it's uh that those systems the idea is behind a scoreboard you're projecting 800 feet to the far seats and in some cases the systems are used up to a half of a mile so it's uh, the focus for me has been getting the most acoustic power that you possibly can uh, out of this thing that, that appears to radiate as a single driver Yeah, over those distances, the very high frequency just get eaten up by air. Yeah. You never get there no matter what. You could put out any amount of it you want. It's not getting there. Yeah, it's like getting 10K to the far side of the stadium. That's a big deal. Takes, uh, you know, 64 HF drivers at least. <laughs> you can do it. Who's the question to? I was at JBL, so I was using that very thing when you know of late. I'm I'm new to community. Okay. Um, now the 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 um, dual voice pull annular ring designs by Alex Voice Velo work very well for high power, um, but they're very expensive. You know, so that one of the one of the side effects but you don't get the the resonance behavior of large domes from it so there's definitely a, a nice payoff um, and you don't have to necessarily use uh, the dual uh, the annular ring designs that we were using at JBL they, they could be single diaphragm as well that was definitely the, what we were doing to go smaller and smaller was it lended itself to that very well The other thing I would add, and I know everybody here has been working on this, is trying to get mid-range, low frequency, and high frequencies all to load into a unified body horn. 
Um, that I think will be a something we'll all be working towards forever. And we can do it. Oh yeah, you absolutely. Can. Just can continue to get better. Try to do it better and better. Guys, got to think up some questions here. Come on. <laughs> I would also add one note to Dale's question: is rarely do any of these practical horns actually follow a single parameter equation, you know, like the textbook from Morris or Peranic. There rarely are that single parameter thing because all of those are based on typical circular following one contour, and very, very few horns actually follow that. And then you typically have multiple sections doing different things. Uh, even if you're trying to follow sort of a conic derivative. So none of those equations really hold up. You know, it's, it's more complicated than that. Yeah. Oh. Right. I mean, when you say, an exponential horn that refers to normally the area expansion of the horn. And that's the way some of the original horns were designed, but the new CD horns, it's more the contours in each, you know, the vertical and horizontal plane, irregardless of where, irregardless of how the area expands. I mean, you kind of divorce the two. So it could end up conical. In reality, the, the Salmon family of equations are more of a uh, analytical starting point. There is actually no such thing as an, as an exponential horn because by the time you get, the, by the time it expands enough to, uh, you know, to be relevant, it eventually it has to actually curl back on itself. You, you, it only takes about two and a half wavelengths, I think it is, before the, the horn mouth itself is expanding faster than the sound can expand, so it's, at, at that point, it's academic. It lifts off the, 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 the equations that say that, you know, an exponential horn produces nothing below its cut, cutoff frequency, well, that infinite exponential horn can exist in the math world, but it can't exist in the physical world, which is why that... that so it does work below cutoff, of course. Yeah, that unreasonable uh, result that there's nothing below the cutoff frequency is only because can't be physically realized. So the idea that uh, a horn has to follow a, you know, a standardized equation really, it breaks down as soon as that horn is finite. In reality, the, you know, the length of the horn, the size of the mouth, the size of the throat is 90% of it. The details of the expansion in between the throat and the mouth is a lot less important than, you know, than the, uh, you know, the, classic uh, analysis would, would have you believe. Yeah, you're trying to establish a wave shape at the end of the day. Um, so just to add to that, if the future of horns is in some ways you agree is to put a true full range horn that has the lows, the highs, the mids, everything into one single coherent source. How does that equate to those of you that are designing line array horns? Do you still have the same goals in terms of line array systems, or are we all trying to move towards a single point source world? Well, I'm working towards the single point <laughs> most of the time. <laughs> I could suggest Tom should address the line array result. <laughs> um, well, they, they sell well. Yeah. <laughs> um, Depends on the wave shape you're trying to establish in the application, in my experience. It's not, it's not so much a product or manufacturer focus question, it's just, uh, you know, if we do want to have that single source for fidelity reasons or whatever reason you want to have them, you know, the a horn that somehow manages to do lows through to highs, does that still apply to the shape of like a, a vertical hang of sources or do you have to, do you feel you were going to have to compromise that vision in some way to achieve a different result at the end, you know, to, to meet a market or, you know, because I know the real world dictates what your budgets are focused on research-wise, 
but is, does that have a different goal in your mind? Is there a different future? Is there like a divergent future here, or are we still working towards the same? I, I think everybody up here is focused more on, on, uh, on uh, practical solutions to, to, to problems, rather than starting with an idea that we're gonna do things a different way because it's right in the way we've been doing it wrong. It's just, the, one of the, the great things about the industry we're, we're in is that there are so many different applications that you'll never come to a point where, okay, this is as good of a speaker as I can make, and so I don't have to do any more. Which will keep it interesting, otherwise. Yeah. <laughs> That's that's why none of us work in, in uh, home high five because Rosan is so much more interesting. Yeah. There's always another problem around the corner. Um, and in in my case, when we did a line array, uh, we did it as a coaxial horn loaded box. That was that was what uh, with, with a passive cardioid combined with the horn. That I did that not because. So why is that, that a line array? Oh, it, and it's, it's, it was designed to be. Arrayed in a in a, in a J shape, but uh, I mean it's an individual box used in multiples to make a J shape. Yeah, yeah. The, it's only coaxial horizontally, so there's a there's a, a row of HF down the center, and the uh, and it's eights that load a low frequency horn. But the reason for that was not because this is the way all line arrays should be done. It's because that was part of what made it a. a uh, interesting and uh, distinctive product yeah. you know I thought we could sell some that way and the application tr drives what you what would be the best choice yeah. too like if you have a like we're, we do a lot of work in stadiums uh, mostly we replace line arrays because they project so much energy to the sides uh, and out of the desired pattern and if you make a large horn uh, you have more control of where that sound goes. That's kind of what my point is though. Why do we not see more large horn linery or horn loaded linery speakers like that, particularly to say Dave's or somewhere where they do have more power control in the mid range or lower frequencies? You know, we see a lot of dominant reflex loaded lows, which causes the problem you are fixing with, by replacing them or by selling a different product. Why is it we don't see more? Horn loaded full range line rate type is already moving towards that goal. I think you're going to see more and more. I mean, I know the, the VLA compact I just finished at JBL is definitely horn loaded all the way through. Um, so I, I think that trend will keep evolving. Well, one of the attractions of a line array is that it's horizontally, it's, it's compact. Mm. So when you're you know, putting it side to side on this. On a, on a stage, it's not just only with a vertical stage. stack. I mean, it's compact horizontally. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, you want me to call it something other than a, than a linery because that's too general, right? <laughs> <laughs> what the touring industry calls a linery. One of the one of the the attractions of that is its compactness, the compactness of an individual box. Yeah, you could make a six foot wide liner. I did one of those once. <laughs> we, we, we sold 12 of them. <laughs> and now people are buying thousands and thousands of 20 inch wide ones. Mm. So apparently that's a, that's a product format that you know has an application. Um, we also do big horns, point source horns. Mm. And uh, we sell a lot of those against line arrays. In fact, you know, the, the biggest effect of introducing a line array has been that when we tell somebody that the big horn is a better solution, they believe us because if they want a line array, we've got one of those too. But if we tell you the big horn is a better solution, then they believe us because we're not selling against somebody else's line array. So yes, there, there are some applications where line arrays are effective. Um, there are an awful lot more where a point source solution is a, is a, is a cheaper and higher fidelity solution. Um, so our, our approach is just to have both of them. Sorry, last one for me on that subject then. So is that because we're moving towards a better type of horn and better understanding of making them work, do you feel? Or is, is it just a change oh, in yeah. taste? Big horns are way better than they, than they were, you know. Well, our big horns are better than the ones that Bruce did in the 70s. <laughs> <laughs> but that so it is. Work. A little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah. When you bring in the Leviathan free out then. Um, <laughs> <don't>. 
probably not. The volume two is an interesting experiment, a lot of fun. So I think maybe two dozen of those. <laughs> well, one thing we just have better analysis tools now is one reason they're getting better. And it's something. I mean, both on the fundamental design, and, but also predicting the coverage in space, too. They were both right now. Mm -hmm. Both much better. Question over here? Oh, I'm sorry, you have the mic? Yeah, okay. sorry, sorry. So, I'm going to ask a question about, I know part of the answer, at least, is uh, proprietary of date, but I'm interested in what you can tell me about how you arrive at your FIR filter uh, that you apply to these horns. It's magic. <laughs> No, it's, um, <laughs> it's not an algorithm or a formula or anything like that. It's, it's, it's a craft more than science. So it's just a matter of having tools to use. Um, and one of the keys is being able to, to look at the response in all different directions and, you know, compromise one thing for another and arrive at, uh, at, at something that you can't perfect the impulse response anywhere without making it worse everywhere else. But the craftsmanship means you can make it better everywhere. So it's perfect nowhere. And making it better everywhere just seems to make it sound better. Yeah, I was, um, when I'm, I was kind of wanting to go the, the, the line array route. Um, and I um, wanted to get your opinions on what you really feel about line array. I know you're saying that aesthetically it's great, but is it, because I know a lot of stuff, when I do inside stuff, I, I much prefer a point source, you know, a 90 by 40. Outside, I like Okay, I'm sorry, repeat that. You much prefer what? Um, point source. What I'm asking is your opinion on the uses of line array, because line array is everywhere now. It's in little, it's in little clubs, it's in big places. What is... Do you think it's a, it's turning into too much of a fad, or is it really, really the answer to the future of audio? And I've, I've written a whole large number of papers on the so-called CBT, which is mm -hmm. uh, Constant Coverage Transducer, which is an acronym which originated in the late 70s by the U.S. Navy underwater sound, that I applied it to line arrays, which dictates that you have to take a number of, uh, of identical transducers and align them on a circular arc, and that simplifies things. So that's why there's a lot of large sound reinforcement systems in arenas and stadiums that are circular arcs. That's the, it's, it's just an inherently simple way of aligning things. And of course you can use direct radiators or horns or anything you want in that configuration. And of course like the big JBL Vertec boxes or whatever can be arrayed in that configuration too. So, so that is, that's a way of specifically tailoring the vertical coverage, assuming you have a, a live vertical line array. As far as the, the line array being, whether it's the answer or an answer, um, at this point in time, I would say that I've been in far more rooms with line arrays that would have been better off with a point source than I have been in point source rooms that would have been better off with a line array. Yeah, I would agree with that. Well, there might come back to that as is those line arrays weren't made damn good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you designed your point source system, which, is, which really did have a uniform mm -hmm. vertical and horizontal coverage. If you, did, if you did design a well-designed line array, it could be quite good also. Mm -hmm. It affects us as designers because we have to answer that. Right. Yes, that's one of those too.
This is going. I don't know how you will respond to this, or if you will, but I have a question about DSP, and I know that, of course, uh, JBL would have Harman DSP in mind for their products, and uh, Dave, I install your products, and I know that you have modules uh, that we can pull for Symmetrics or uh, BSS or whatever, uh, QSIS. When you guys are designing your speakers, do you, do you sit and go through these processors at that particular time, or do you design with a specific processor in the loop and then go back and take that and port it over to the other DSP devices? And then what, what differences do you find between DSP devices? Well, in terms of audio quality, I don't really care. There's, there's at least a dozen of them that are... That are that are better than my speakers. So um, the big differences between DSPs has to do with the, the definitions of the filters. And you, there's just no way that you can type in filters and have it come out right. So we have a sample DSP from every possible choice. And I think uh, Rich Fremis has 24 different uh, uh, you know, rack units. And when we publish the, the, the settings for them, he measures transfer function through the DSP and individually tweaks filters to match what the one we did the design with was. So no, we're, I'm completely DSP agnostic. It's just you have to get the settings right and then they'll all sound, you know, they're, sure there are slight differences between them, but they're, they're nothing like the differences between loudspeakers. And those primary differences in the IIR section, the FIR, the great thing with FIR is it translates across the board. Um, so that's why if you heavy use that, you're minimizing your work. Just, you know, latency issues and other things you have to deal with, of course, with FIR. I'll go on the other side. I'm, I'm happy to take a charge So. Got, I've got a question for towards the design phase. Obviously, you guys have all got a long history in designing horns. Has your methodology changed a lot with the tools that have become available? For example, are any of you now finding you're using things like console or FEA a lot more in the prediction phase before you even build a prototype? Or are you still doing you know, napkin maths, building a box, trying it out, measuring it, taking it to environments? You know, do you find that you're still sticking to the old school or do you find <coughs> new tools or are you is it a committee process? You know, what, what, what's changed and what's still the same in designing a good horn? I still pretty much do it the old way. Same mixture. I tend to do the HF horns the old way because it's ge just geometrical and uh, low frequency horns using console. Um, well, as a final step, I mean, I still use two dimensional, uh, um, you know, Horn equation based analysis, but you know, being aware of the limitations of that, when I get to something that I think I'm pretty close to having right, then I'll, I'll go put it in Comsol and, and see what that says. I'm using Comsol more and more, but the problem is you can typically build a prototype and measure it faster than you can make the model. <laughs> um, well, and, 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 and software and, problem, yeah. Really. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and, and then Comsol will help you see the problem, but it rarely tells you the solution. So you still, at the end of the day, have to guide your own way. So it doesn't fit well into an iterative process. It's, it's mostly, am I done or am I not done? It's, it's where two-dimensional modeling is so nice because you can go through hundreds of iterations, but you can also paint yourself into a corner where you think you've got something perfect and it doesn't actually work. Yeah, and then also on something very complicated, knowing just what the wave shape is as you're starting is oftentimes impossible to know, and you, Comsol has to know what that is, and so you wind up with a, with a problem you can't solve in Comsol anyway. Um, so you're faced with that. Manifolds and, and phase plug designs, Comsol can be very useful. Curious to know what Tom's using these days for fidelity. <laughs> <Huh. clears throat> Um, don't tell him. <laughs> <laughs> Most of the time I use Acomac, which is a simple uh, 2D program. Yeah, um, right. 
to you can get a lot done with two D. Yeah. yeah, and to derive things like the combiner, um, I I picture that in my head and then build an experimental, you know, say. And that's the thing about computer models. They're, they're only good to the point that they predict what you measure when you build the real thing. And uh, like with Akabak, that you can make as complicated as you want, but uh, you're better off building something and saying, okay, this part's not the same at all. What do you have to monkey with to, to make the prediction? The wonderful thing about a prototype is that you know there are no factors that you've forgotten. Yeah. They're all in there. It is what it is. Yeah. We did, uh, I have been bitten in the rear a few times though, because there's things that you don't as assume, like that the wood is completely rigid. And depending on what you have, that can make a big difference. Uh, in one case, it appeared that we had several cubic feet of extra volume, which obviously wasn't there. And the only way to derive that was to say, okay, start filling up this cavity with pieces of two by four and see if that jives with the change in the prediction. And, uh, and then that pointed to the panel that wasn't stiff enough. So unexpected though. A lot of, a lot of uh, loudspeaker design is not necessarily sexy. It's just, uh, it's just hard work. <laughs> yeah, covered with sawdust. It's really fancy to do a, to do a, you know, an FBA model, but if the prototype doesn't work like the FBA model, yeah, you're starting over. It's, you know, and that's true. Of, true of room acoustics too. There's a lot of modeling software for that, but very few measurements of the finished result. So it's. Uh, there's another area where that same rule applies. Hi, so uh, I am very new to this field, so I was just wondering if you might be able to go over um, maybe the differences in uh, your design processes for designing a horn for a large venue versus maybe putting one that would be using like a studio monitor, just kind of like the steps that you would take and uh, those different you know, types of situations. It's fundamentally the same. It's just a matter of scale. <laughs> yeah. Typically, the studio monitor horn needs to match the directivity of the woofer. In a larger room, you have the room telling you what directivity it should be, and then all frequencies that you can control try and get to that directivity. So you come at it from two different perspectives, if you will. You know, that's a, that's a good point. In a, in a room, <coughs> you're trying... <clears throat> you're trying to focus the energy on the listeners and not light up the walls and the ceiling. Whereas in a, in a studio, um, you know, your reverb time is half a second instead of three seconds. So it's just a matter of, uh, um, you don't have to be so concerned with the, the coverage pattern. So the horn is mostly, how does it sound on axis where the, where the mixer's sitting? In, a, uh, in any kind of a venue with an audience, it's a different challenge because you're trying to make it sound good for everybody in the audience, not just the one guy who, who hired the band. So uh, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's very much like the difference between you know, designing for home fi hi-fi versus for pro sound. Why use the horn for the studio monitor if you're mostly concerned about on axis? Why use the horn for a studio monitor? Because dome tweeters squash when you turn them up. And that's that's why I do it. Most people use dome tweeters and studio monitors. Um, I don't know if anybody else is talking a studio monitor, so I'm just going to take that one because we have one of the few horn loaded studio monitors out there. And the difference is that especially with things like hi-hat and cymbals, when you turn it up, a, uh, a dome tweeter starts squashing the high frequencies. It just can't create the, the high level Is that a single dome tweeter or used in multiples? Not just a, sing a typical studio monitor with like a three quarter inch dome tweeter right. versus a studio monitor with a, you know, with a one inch compression driver mm -hmm. on a coaxial horn. Yeah, the, the horn would give you some directivity too. Mm -hmm. And the gain that the horn gives you 
EQ out, and that gives you headroom. Uh, yeah, so it takes less power, yeah. there's less power compression, mostly just in terms of, I mean, if we're talking about studio monitors, so it's mostly uh, perception, and the perception is just that the, the character holds together better uh, from low level to high level. So it's just taking that from the pro sound field and putting it in studio monitors. Also being relatively new to the field, this has been fascinating to listen to you gentlemen talk about your life's work. Is there a problem that has been present, challenge for you guys as, as engineers and designers that uh, has been around since the get-go that you still can't solve? Is there anything that's still vexing you guys, or is it all just a matter of working through the math? If you had a unobtainium to make the parts out of, we could make a big improvement. Uh, the problem with a compression driver, though, is that it's unlike a direct radiator, which is an acceleration uh, profile. The, the dome in a, in a horn, or the driver in a horn, is a velocity profile. So that's the 60 dB per active slope different. And uh, so if you look at a compression driver, you, you go, wow, that is a huge motor for how big the radiator is. And that's why. Uh, it's because of that difference in, in what you're trying to achieve from the diaphragm. And in that case, like they were saying before, you've got mass that's a, a low frequency, you know, roll off, or uh, makes it roll off, and you have series inductance. Uh, and to some degree, how big the radiator is, uh, that, that governs how, how it couples. There's a, um, in the radiation resistance curve, you have a point where the Diameter is the circumference on the knee kind of goes like that. So if you wanted to make a really powerful high frequency driver, it almost has to be, well, it has to be smaller for that reason. And then if you had materials that were substantially different than we have now, you could make a big difference. Um, I don't have any of that stuff. Richard and Wiggles. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, that would help. We've got some of that in Manchester. Yeah. The uh, power handling <laughs> is, a, is a perpetual problem because um, somebody blows up a driver. Let's say you blew up a driver last night, and I said, well, how many watts were you putting to it? You have no idea. Yeah. Nobody ever knows the conditions that the driver was subjected to. So how do you know when you're driving it too hard? Well. The only thing reliable is if it starts to sound bad when you're driving it too hard. So there, there have been a few things I've done over the years that didn't know how to sound bad, and so people ended up blowing them up. Right, because you, know, you didn't get that. You don't get the cue. The distortion cue that you know, yep. better turn it down. But. Absolutely. So, I, you know, I killed one product because it didn't know how to sound bad. <laughs> it's like, no, we just can't sell this because people keep blowing them up. If you, make, you know, the louder you make a product, there, there's no point when it's loud enough because some sound guy is always going to go in and, and kill the limiter to see how loud it actually goes. Yeah. You know how you find out how loud it goes? You turn it up until it, you find out how loud it doesn't go. In the servo drive days, we sent some boxes out for evaluation and the guy that brought them back and said, well, I know they handle more than 1,300 watts because I couldn't burn them out. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> Don't do that. Um, on that. So I'm actually, uh, I've got comments coming in from people on the internet here that are watching me. Uh, I've got someone asking, when you are designing uh, modern high bandwidth, uh, high SPL compression drivers or horns, um, how do you handle the amount of intermodulation artifacts or products that you get in that process? Uh, how are you guys tackling that challenge of getting wider bandwidth from a single horn but having less IM distortion? Where the sound goes, that's, that's the physics of what's involved and that kind of draws a box of where you cannot go past. Um, part of the issue with multiple drivers is getting them to, to add together without producing loads or cancellation. Uh, and that it takes some thought um, to get there. Do you feel, do you feel that, do you feel that's a, um, 
parts or materials problem that we've sort of worked towards solving that? Or is there maybe a different type of horn design you've not, or combination you've not come across yet or thought of that maybe would help in those fields? Well, I, I, I'm trying to focus on using drivers that you can buy off the shelf. I don't want to make drivers. Uh, so then it's a geometry issue. How can, you, how can you get them close enough together to add? How can you arrange them so the wave fronts don't interfere with each other? I'm not sure if that answers your question. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, well, it's a question come up. Oh yeah, no, it, seems, it seems pretty happy with the answer. Um, I saw what I might find with a lot of people who are almost anti-horn, particularly on, say, larger format horns. They, they argue that they're, particularly if you approach a wider bandwidth and higher SPL from a single horn, I find this argument a lot with uh, some of the Danny products that we're pushing and when I've talked to people about Fulcrum stuff is when you, if you coax a speaker, they think that when you're approaching a higher SPL level, there's going to be some kind of compression or artifacts forming at the throat or somewhere in the horn that you can't fix. And therefore they go, well, multiples of smaller horns or a linear system is maybe more, it's better because it has less of those in a single location. Um, is there a solution to that or is there an answer towards that? That maybe The, the highest SPL is at the dome of the compression driver. As the area expands, the SPL is going down continuously. So, I'm not sure. I'm not sure it's easy to get a cone driver to produce anything close to the pressure that a dome compression <coughs> driver does. So it's, um, and the air air has nonlinearity. I mean, it's uh, it produces predominantly a second harmonic uh, when it's under high pressure. In fact, the, the levitation transducers that we used to use at Intersonics, those, those could produce, a, if you had six of them, about 175 dB, and that's, that's loud enough to light a cigarette. Uh, but <laughs> the, the thing that limits how high a single one can go is that the air, Roy used to call it shocking up, but what, have, what effectively happened is the pressure side of the wave front is actually slightly warmer than the vacuum side. And that means it travels faster. So at uh, like 165, uh, when 20 kilohertz travels a foot, it's turned into a sawtooth wave uh, from that effect. The pressure side travels faster. And once you reach that sawtooth, uh, then you have a great deal of absorption, uh, uh, air absorption from that, the equivalent of a high frequency transient. I wouldn't worry too much about that stuff in audio, though, because yeah. that's very specialized stuff. The, time yeah, <laughs> um, the, the, the concept of throat distortion is something people have known around, uh, about for a long time, but you know, sometimes knowing something is real doesn't mean it's important. So okay. yeah. I've had people say, yeah, well, you shouldn't do that because it's going to drive up the throat distortion. I'm like, look, by the time the throat distortion becomes significant, you're going to have so many other sources of distortion that you'll never know. So, in, I, I, you know, long ago just decided to completely ignore throat distortion. Yeah, and the second harmonic's the least audible of yeah, all. At least, at least so, they're, yeah. you know, music. Where is that at 15K? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you have big horns. Um, our approach lately has been to put a, a fairly large high frequency horn in the front of a big horn. Yeah. You know, that's, that's not new. I think, uh, I'm not sure how far you have to go back to do that, but I know there were, that Bruce did some in the 70s, and he probably wasn't the first one. Jack Frazier. There was some RCA. A long time ago. Yeah, so it's not a new concept. Um, one of the challenges with, uh, with a coaxial horn, or basically with any two horns, is that you can get enough pressure from the woofer to actually modulate the compression driver diaphragm. And so, you know, addressing that tends to keep the, uh, the high frequency compression driver cleaner. In our case, when we do passive horns, we, we try to do it with uh, second order crossovers just so that the, uh, so that the voice coil is shunted yeah. by, a, you know, by an inductor, meaning at low frequencies, the voice coil is held constant. I mean, it's, it's held uh, firmer. The, act, the, the voice call actually helps yeah. hold it in place because it's shorter. Sure. 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 Okay. And, uh, and that helps a lot. Um, and the other thing that we found that helps is, is using a bigger high frequency horn 
just collecting less pressure to the compression driver and to push it all the way to the, to the front and up to the grill. And that's where the flare rate matters too because the, the distortion depends on how slow the expansion is. So you go to a CD horn where it flares out quickly and the SPL in it drops off very quickly compared to that. So it's much better that way too. Absolutely. So I really feel like I'm dominating here because I'm not I'm one of the questions. There's a guy over there. But one quick more, just to terms of, you said quickly, knowing this is really new, how much of this in terms of talking about the future of horns, how much of the future is going back to the future in terms of, you know, how many, as much of it is digging in old textbooks, finding that guy who, or an old, you know, catalog, finding the guy who had the great idea in the 40s or the 50s, 60s, 70s that you can kind of crib on and redevelop for your own new product lines. I don't know. <laughs> that's, that's a legitimate answer. You know, I, if I knew what was going to happen in the future, I'd have done it already. <laughs> was wondering if based, you know, based on the past, yeah, we do keep recycling these ideas and just doing them better. And you know, sometimes there's a a new material that came from a real industry that you know we get to, we get to glom onto. And that means you go back and redo something that you did before, but this time you get to do it better. So a lot of progress is, is rehashing stuff. Um, it's always tough in a, in a future of anything kind of discussion to say, this is, this is the thing I'm working on right now. You know, I don't want to look that out. A lot of things go back to work done, dude. Sure does. Was wondering if the panel would uh, just discuss or talk about the use of ribbon drivers and using a horn, as some products appear to have a horn to them and others appear to have almost no directionality control. Well, I, what I would say is that a, a ribbon driver, um, I'm not sure how suitable that is for getting the acoustic gain that a horn has, although the directivity is absolutely something you can get. A ribbon driver driving a horn, you mean? Yeah. Or, or by itself? Um, well, you're saying that what if some have the horn attached to them and some don't? I, I, it seems to me that a ribbon would be generally too large to have any acoustic loading up high. I mean, you'd be past K equals one. But you still have control of directivity. The, the, the waveguide application of a horn rather than one, one client yeah. people's transformation. Thank you. you know, one of the challenges with ribbons is assuming it's vertical, it's a collapsing vertical pattern. So, you know, adding what looks like a horn um, horizontally can, you know, confine the output down to a certain frequency um, but it probably doesn't act like a like a uh, you know an impedance loading horn as much as it is just a directional it's a boundary condition mm -hmm. is there anything else can you get the uh, SPL out of the ribbon how much do you need <laughs> you can get some SPL out of a ribbon no, they don't, I mean, you can't, I, I haven't seen a ribbon that can compete with a individual four-inch compression driver, but then, you know, you could stack a whole bunch of ribbons, get whatever you want. Um, I personally just don't like the sound of ribbons. I'd rather start with a compression driver, but that's, you know, that's just a matter of taste. What about the sound don't you like? But I don't like the, the uh, high level or low no, level? The, the lack of damping. People say, oh, they're really fast. And it's kind of like when they say that, uh, that a woofer is fast. Well, <laughs> and a woofer is faster than another, another woofer. But when they say that a woofer is slow, it usually means that it's, it's slow in damping. There's still s s sound coming out after you wanted it to stop. And I feel the same way about ribbons that, yeah, okay, they start at the same speed as everybody else, but. Uh, but yeah. they don't damp out as fast. I made, made one uh, with an aluminum ribbon once, and I played a Ry Cooter uh, album, it's a, on a bright guitar recording. I thought, man, this is really good. And then I played something else that wasn't bright. I thought, oh man, I 
now I hear the artifacts, it sounds like aluminum. <laughs> like if you scratch it with your fingernail. And that, that had no damping, it was just floating in the air. But... Question over here. I'm wondering if you could say anything about the uh, quantifying the difference between, or the uh, relative importance between uh, pattern control and what I'll call fidelity. Um, by that I mean uh, my colleagues and I a lot of times have experience where we see two kind of similar loudspeakers in the same type of room and one, we look at the you know, directivity, polar plots, ease modeling, stuff like that, and we can see you know, one does have you know, more pattern control, I'll say, uh, but the other one maybe just seems to have a better result and be more intelligible in the same type of room just you know, because it's seemingly has you know better coherence, fidelity, more consistent across the pattern. One of the great contributions of Floyd Tool was the direct correlation between power response and a listener experience, and that directly ties to how well behaved the directivity control is of the loudspeaker. So that there is a direct correlation. And oftentimes things don't get perceived well because you might have very poor directivity in one section and the woofer, say, is actually doing what it does and does it very predictably. So I, I certainly, and, and I know, that, that, well, at JBL, we've certainly looked at this very closely. If you had poor directivity, particularly, say, between a crossover region, that was perceived much lower in sound quality than something that had much better directivity control. I think uh, in uh, intelligibility analysis, um, I've sat through a lot of presentations on intelligibility, and the one thing that always kind of bugs me is that if you look at the parameters that are used to, say, predict intelligibility, they never include anything regarding the uh, the the subtle qualities of a loudspeaker or the subtleties of how well a system is tuned. And anybody who goes out and tunes systems knows that the same loudspeaker may be, uh, may have very poor intelligibility when you start and by the time you get done, it has very good intelligibility and it's because of subtleties in tuning. But if you look at the predictions, none of those subtleties are accounted for. So. Yeah, you're talking about two different loudspeakers in the same space, and one model's better, but the other one sounds better, or is more intelligible. It could just, it could be these uh, subtleties of loudspeaker performance, and, you know, directionality, the analysis you do with ease is only part of it. It's a very important part of it, and if you don't solve the directionality issues, then you'll never get to a good result, but, uh, you know, it also matters how good the loudspeaker is. In my original idea for this uh, panel discussion, uh, I had planned to go on for about this much time and then allow for uh, a short time of a sort of breakout sessions where these gentlemen on the panel could retreat to their, their four corners, five corners. <laughs> I don't know how you get five corners in a room, but I'm still working on that. Um, and, and meet with you individually and maybe have, uh, answer some questions that they may not want to answer in a public <laughs> uh, kind of forum. But it's really, this, this time is yours. We've got 15 minutes left. Um, is that something you'd like to do or are there more questions from the floor that we should uh, consider together? I, I know offering options like that to a group like this, I'm gonna get zero response. And I got exactly what I thought I'd get. So here's what we're going to do. First, we're going to express our appreciation for the panel. And we appreciate your being here too. Thank you. And now, watch this. And you think that was bad. And I think we'll, we'll try the breakout thing. So gentlemen, go to your four.
four corners and, and um, guys interact with them. And again, thank you so much for participating and um, see you around. <laughs> Some of these guys are going to be out of the room just for a moment. <laughs>